Potters often make repeat products, but small-scale furniture making tends to focus on expensive one-offs and a client-based market. And one thing I was quite adamant about was not, not making fake antiques. And once or twice people would ask me to uh, distress a piece of furniture. I, I always used to say, well, if you've got children, they'll ruin it quick enough. <laughs> Had no tools, no market, couldn't borrow even 50 quid from the bank. Very different times then. I do realise it looks a bit like a World War I triplane. <laughs> and the, the handles again, are very simple bog oak handles. There's no point over engineering it, and we British are very good at over engineering it. You under engineer it. Why? Because you see where the stress points are. But who, who are these people? What sort of people buy my work? They're overwhelmingly well-educated, professional people. I tend not to get celebrities or rock stars because my work's not, it's not flamboyant enough for the seat. So, one of the great things about creating a product is to a degree you control the price because I, current, I still make this chair. So supposing I made it for £10,000, I don't, but I make them for about 2000 That affects the value of early ones, surely. Every job is a prototype, and we have to make jigs and formers which may never be used again. Andy, do you think I should share the findings of my PhD in marketing? Is that the, uh, the girl in the pub story? This stretched over about three or four years' work, all because I chatted up somebody else's girlfriend in a pub. <laughs> Working directly with a client means we can get the full price, no, because nobody else wanting a, a slice of the of the profits. Why aren't there platforms where most people, well, which will enable most people to be very aware of what makers they are and what they do? Because people seem completely ignorant that such things are going on.